Okay, welcome uh, to week number four uh, of uh, developmental psychology. Today we are talking about the chapter known as early childhood biosocial development. Early childhood is basically about ages two to six, okay? And we're talking about biosocial development, basically mostly biological, but the environment does have an influence. Okay, so let's get started and talk about what we need to talk about. Here's the overview, here's our outline. So we're gonna talk about body shape and growth. We're gonna talk about eating habits, brain development. There'll be some things there that we already talked about because I tend to repeat myself. And you need to be reminded anyway what these things are and we'll talk about them as they apply to this period of life. We'll talk about motor skills, again, gross motor skills and fine motor skills uh, and what they can and cannot do. And we'll talk about something serious known as injuries and abuse that includes things like physical abuse and sexual abuse what that is and how to prevent it, things like that. So um, we're gonna cover all this today, so let's get started. And remember to save your questions until after the lecture when I stop recording. So first let's talk about body shape and growth. So early childhood is ages two to six basically, okay? So children uh, two to six are different than, you know, children that are basically zero to two, birth to, to two. Okay, from two to six years of age, children become slimmer, okay? Uh, they have less body fat, so their body gets a little bit longer, okay? They get taller, okay, and they look slimmer. Like this little girl over here, you can see on the image, she's probably maybe three years old or maybe two and a half or something like that. But as they get, as they go from two to six, they get longer, right? They get slimmer, they get taller, and they will look, look less like babies and more like kids, okay? So they get taller. They gain about three inches and about four and a half pounds per, per year. They're still growing really fast. Three inches per year is fast, okay? Uh, but, and four and a half pounds per year. The average six-year-old will be about 46 pounds, 46 ounces. No, I mean 46 pounds and 46 inches, okay? And that's easy to remember, okay? Your child might be taller or shorter, depending, okay, on uh, where they're at, okay? Depending on nutrition and genetics and other factors okay so they look different okay they don't look the same way so they get longer okay so no more protruding belly they don't necessarily have a big belly anymore uh, they do when they're closer to age two they can still have a what looks like a big belly but as they get closer to age six that belly should disappear and they should look more normal unless of course your kid is obese overweight they can still have a big belly but if your kid is normal normal height weight they will look slimmer. They won't have that protruding belly that they have when they're newborns. When they newborns, when they're newborns, they just look like uh, you, they just look like little fat men. Okay, they're uh, they don't have a lot of hair, so they look kind of bald, and they have big bellies, and they they look fat. Okay, but that's normal. Um, they don't. They shouldn't look that way as they get closer to six years of age. Uh, no more short limbs. Their their legs get longer. Their arms get longer, and that's part of what makes them look slimmer and taller is that their legs lengthen. They gain a lot of height from, uh, from their legs, okay? Um, their face doesn't look as round anymore, okay? Yeah, they can still have cheeks and, you know, uh, when they're closer to age two, but when they get closer to age two, their, their face won't look so round, won't look so, they won't have such a chubby looking face. They'll look more normal. The head won't look so large anymore compared to the rest of their body because their body will get longer and then their head won't look so big compared to the rest of their body. It is still big compared to adults, okay? But uh, it's not, you know, it's not no, no more, it's not the case anymore that their head is making up like a third of their body or something like that, or a third of their body length, okay? Uh, they will look uh, slimmer, uh, longer. Uh, they still look very cute, okay, during this age. Well, uh, keep going. Um, so this brings us to eating habits, of course. Uh, Height and weight are, weight are affected by eating habits. Uh, nutrition, genes, health will all affect height. It will affect weight. Uh, um, and these things, nutrition, genes, and health, uh, 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 account for lower height uh, in, in poor nations. In, in poor nations, as we mentioned before, um, we talked about malnutrition, that nutrition isn't as good or as readily available. Uh, genetics, not as much. In some places, yes. But... Uh, uh, health will also suffer from because of lack of nutrition or inadequate nutrition. Okay, so keep that in mind. We met, we talked a lot about that already when we talked about malnutrition. 
But what you should know from ages two to six is that appetite will change. Their appetite will decrease from ages two to six. From zero to two, you kind of feed them a lot and uh, you know, they bottle feed, they breastfeed, you start introducing some, you know, some soft foods and stuff. Um, and they seem to eat a lot because they're growing very quickly. Uh, during this time, they're still growing quickly, but their appetite will decrease a little bit, okay? They won't uh, be hungry all the time necessarily. They won't eat uh, you know, around the clock necessarily. They actually need less calories per pound of body fat. Okay, they're not growing as fast anymore. They're not accumulating as much fat. Okay, mothers will often worry that their children don't eat enough. They look slim. They think their children are too thin and, uh, and they're worrying, um, but they shouldn't worry. It's just normal that children don't eat as much during this time. They uh, look slimmer um, and uh, you, don't, you shouldn't worry so much and then try to feed them more often. If you do that, try to get them to eat when they're not really hungry and stuff like that. Uh, you're actually going to make your children overweight, okay? And we'll talk about obesity uh, in a later chapter, but that becomes a problem. My wife has that problem where she has this tendency where she thinks the kids need to be eating all the time. Even though the kids are bigger now, they're like seven and nine, but even when they were between two to six and before that, it's just, you know, it's always that they have their meals and they would have snacks in between, and she was always feeding them. And, uh, you know, my little girl is basically overweight now because of that. And we've had a lot of fights about that, but we'll talk about obesity separate time. My boy is more normal, but he's also gaining a little bit of weight and, you know, probably overfeeding them, okay? Um, they will tell you when they're hungry or, they'll, or, or you'll know when they're hungry, okay? Uh, and feed them when they're hungry. Don't feed them when they're not hungry, okay? Children, uh, you know, often won't get all the vitamins and minerals that they need during this time. They won't always get a lot of iron, calcium, or zinc. It seems to be a particular problem with those things. Uh, because a lot of kids during this age will get a lot of snacks, okay? They'll get those, you know, potato chips that, you know, popcorn or candy bars, soda, instead of their veggies and milk, okay? Instead of the legumes and all the things that they should be eating, they get too many snacks. And these snacks are mostly empty calories, a lot of fat, a lot of sugar, a lot of salt is what these, and a lot of calories is what these snacks provide. We'll talk about obesity later. These are high calorie foods that are often inadequate, don't provide the nutrients that the kids need, the, you know, the, uh, you know, all the vitamins and minerals and the calcium and all those things that they need. Uh, and they will reduce their appetite further. These, these snacks are, have a lot of calories. And if your children is eating a lot of these things, they probably don't, are not eating enough of the other healthy things that they should be getting. Okay, so keep that in mind. But yes, we tend to overfeed our kids, especially nowadays, okay? Too much snacking going on, too much junk food. And we'll talk about obesity later. It's a big problem, and I have a lot to say about that, okay? Uh, hazards of just right. A lot of the children will, will only eat certain kinds of foods prepared in a certain way, so the food has to be just right, or things have to be just right, or they won't eat it. It's something that would be pathological, a sign of a kind of mental illness um, or some mother illness or a biological illness in adults. If adults act that way, where they only eat certain kinds of foods, or only if it's a certain way, it might indicate that it's obsessive compulsive disorder, right? But it's normal in children who are under six. And children who are under six, it's normal for them to act that way, where they only want to eat, let's say, where they don't want to eat their meat, for instance, okay? Or they don't want their vegetables to touch, uh, you know, their rice or their meat or whatever it is. Or they want to make sure that their peas are all lined up properly or the food is in a certain way. That is actually normal in children. They want things you know, a lot of them will show this behavior where they want things to be just right. It's normal in children, it doesn't indicate a problem, okay? Uh, but if you have an adult that's that way, that does indicate a problem because they usually outgrow that kind of stuff. Now, there are children who are a bit more, more fussy, of course, and, and overdo this just right behavior, and that might actually indicate a problem. I, I, like, for instance, I have a nephew who just refuses to eat absolutely anything unless it's McDonald's, or it's uh, Top Ramen, he likes Top Ramen, but he will not drink milk, he will not eat ice cream, he won't eat pizza, and the parents are having a really hard time feeding this kid. They have to have him on, he, he drinks Pedialyte and, he ha and they have him on other things, uh, basic to make sure he gets the proper nutrients because he refuses to eat normal food. He will not eat it, just refuses. But he'll eat those chicken nuggets from McDonald's. There's very few things he likes to eat. Chicken nuggets are one of those things, but he doesn't like the other stuff, okay? No, not the fruit, 
not the burgers, it's the chicken nuggets. He wants to eat only that or top ramen. He refuses to eat anything else. And that's a big problem. And they are taking the kid to a therapist to figure out what's wrong and trying to introduce him to foods and having him taste it and him to get used to it. But he still has that problem. Hopefully he'll outgrow it. But yes, that is more severe and quite a problem. Okay. Um, there was a survey that was done. They surveyed 1,500 parents about their, uh, about their kids' eating habits. And these children that they, that they surveyed them about were children who were one to six years of age. Survey done in 1997. And what they found is that, that over 75% of kids during this age evidence some kind of just right uh, behavior, just right tendencies. So it's quite frequent, quite normal for kids to want things a certain way during this time, or they won't eat them, they won't touch them if they're not a certain way, okay? Um, and the just right tendency doesn't just have to do with, uh, with food, it has to do with other things as well. 75% of actually three-year-olds evidence this just right tendency, a little bit more than 75%. So they prefer to have things done in a certain way, or a certain order, okay? Uh, where, you know, first they need to like read a book, and then they need to, you know, get their, you know, or first there's the bath, then it's the book, then they can go to bed, otherwise they won't fall asleep. Or they want uh, food that's only of a certain kind or that, it, that the, the, the peas are always on the right side and the meat is on the left side or something like that. And they show these kind of tendencies or they refuse to eat certain kinds of things. They have a strong preference to wear or not wear certain clothes. They only wanna wear certain kinds of clothes. My son went through that, he only wanted to wear green. Okay, it's his favorite color. And he has a lot of green clothes. Um, and he colors everything green, green cats and green dogs. And, you know, he had this kind of behavior, okay? They prepared bedtime by engaging in special activity or routine. Yeah, I talked about the bedtime routine, right? That first, you know, they, or maybe they eat and they watch some TV and then there's, there is a bath time, then story time, and then bedtime. And if you don't do it in the right order, they won't want to fall asleep. Strong preference for certain kinds of foods, okay? And that can be severe and very... Uh, uh, extreme with some kids. And you as a parent have control over that to some extent, okay? You have a lot to do with that. If you spoil your kids rotten and take them to McDonald's all the time, they might learn that, that, you know, that that's what they like and they don't want to eat other things. I've known plenty of kids who refuse to eat anything other than McDonald's. But there's other kids that are even more extreme that will only want to eat a certain thing from McDonald's and refuse to eat anything else. So, but it's, t it's common in these kinds of kids during this age but just know that you have a lot to do with that, okay? Depending on what you feed them and what things you get them used to. A lot of kids also have allergies during this time, three to 8% of preschool children. Actually, th yeah, this is like the preschool years, um, have allergies, okay? Um, like a lot of them are allergic to cow's milk or maybe eggs, peanuts or tree nuts, soy, wheat, fish, shellfish, these are some common allergies. They can, link, they can be linked to uh, medical conditions. You know, they might have something biologically wrong with them, you know, or some genetic difference, um, or, it, or it could be something that has to do with the fact that they're not e used to eating those kinds of foods. Diagnostic standards, like, you know, how it's diagnosed, whether they have an allergy or not, it varies, you know, sometimes it, it, you know, if they have an allergy, it could be, you know, that they develop a rash, or that you get a stomach ache or something like that, uh, or it might be something even less severe that they maybe they just, uh, you know, they just don't like it or, you know, or that, you know, they refuse to eat it or they might, or maybe they just makes them a little bit, uh, they just show a little bit of discomfort or they might get really sick and be, you know, really ill if they eat something like this, where they could actually, they could potentially die. So, you know, what, so what indicates whether they have an allergy? It varies, okay? How extreme does it have to be? So it varies depending on which test you use. Um, but also treatment varies, okay? Uh, you know, sometimes they just, you know, Treatment is that they totally avoid whatever they're allergic to, avoid the, you know, the peanuts, avoid the soy, the fish, or the eggs, or whatever it is that they're allergic to. Or they might also try medically supervised small increment exposure in which they eat just a little bit of that kind of food that they're supposedly allergic to, a little bit at a time, a little bit so it doesn't do too much harm, and then a little bit more next time, a little bit more so they can get used to it. Um, by the way, there's some, some allergies are there because the children just aren't used to that kind of food. Like for instance, like a lot of children can be allergic to cow's milk and children who are more alert, there's more children allergic to cow's milk in places 
where they don't just don't have a lot of cow's milk. There are places where, uh, where that, that's kind of scarce and children will drink other kinds of milk, maybe soy milk, or believe it or not, you can get milk from a horse, a female horse, a mare, uh, like the country, I think it's um, Cambodia, I think, no, Mongolia. In Mongolia, they get a lot of milk from, uh, from horses or from, from a mare. And uh, in those children, you'll probably find more allergies to cow's milk because they're just not exposed to it that much. And as a matter of fact, even you as an adult, if you're not exposed to cow's milk, if you're vegan, so to speak, and you avoid dairy products, you'll find that over time, you will actually become allergic to cow's milk. You'll be lactose intolerant. That's happened to me, actually. And it happens to a lot of people who avoid these things. I'm, um, I'm not completely vegan. I will eat pizza from time to time, rarely, but not that often. But I mostly avoid dairy because, well, I am... I started out being vegetarian and then I decided to go vegan because it turns out that even though I was vegetarian, my cholesterol was still a little bit higher than it should have been. So I decided, you know what? Okay, I just have to avoid all things that have cholesterol. Avoid the eggs, avoid the milk, the dairy. And basically that means I have to be vegan. I will make exceptions every now and then, but very rarely, only a few times a year. But now I find I can't drink regular milk. I'm lactose intolerant now. And that, like I said, that can happen if you're not exposed to milk early on or or you're not exposed to milk regular cow's milk for long periods of times okay by the way you yeah, like i said i'll say this again you're you're we're not talking about newborns anymore but newborns should not be drinking cow's milk okay it takes them a while to be ready for that in their first year they should not be drinking cow's milk breast milk okay formula cow milk is actually bad for them okay and cause problems like diarrhea and things like that um but these allergies can also be outgrown okay they can outgrow their allergy and they may not be allergic when they're adults, or it can get worse, it can increase or decrease with age, depending on exposure, depending on, on other things. They, uh, you know, allergies kind of vary the way they come about, the way they treat it, and how they, and, and they change over time. Let's keep going. Now let's talk about the brain. Yes, nutrition will affect the brain, okay? When we were talking a little bit about nutrition. Uh, I mentioned some of these things already, but uh, 70, the brain is 75% of, it if, of its adult weight by age two. We talked about that, okay? But from ages two to six, the brain grows larger, okay? Not as fast as before, but by age five, the brain will be 90% 90 of its adult weight, okay? 90% by age five. So by age five, their head is already pretty big compared to how big it's going to get. 90%, it's, it's, the brain is about 90% of the weight it's gonna be. Almost 100% by age seven. Think about that, by age seven, they're, you know, their head is almost as large as it's gonna be, pretty much, okay? Uh, I look at my own children, my daughter's nine, her head, she has the biggest head of all. She, her head's bigger than mine, bigger than my wife's, and my, my seven-year-old already, he's gonna be eight. Yeah, his head is already bigger than his mom. His mom has a little head, okay? Um, but he's about as, same as, as mine, so about 100% by age seven. Myelination, uh, remember myelin is that fatty tissue around the axon of neurons that speeds neurotransmission. So myelination will keep developing and develops rapidly uh, during ages two to six. So, and myelination makes the neurons communicate faster, okay? So myelin, that fatty insulation of the neurons allow to, allows toddlers to think faster and in more complex ways, okay? So they can remember things better. Memory will improve. Their ability to use language and talk and do lots of things will improve as, as myelin develops. Their neurons communicate faster. And that will help with language. It will help with memory, with problem solving. It will help with movement as well, okay? They'll be better at hearing, better at speaking, better at catching and throwing a ball, okay? Because, you know, infants are clumsy and, and very forgetful. Their myelin is not yet well developed. But by the time you know they get closer to age six, seven, uh, they will be very coordinated. Okay, you know, more graceful uh, in how they move, and you know, and just be better at thinking in general. The neurons communicate faster and in more complex ways. It's all part of brain development. It's affected most by experience. Yes, your children need a lot of time to play, and practice language, and speak, and hearing, and all those things. All those things are good for their development. Development. And if you're talking about sports and you know want that you want them to be graceful and good at sports, well, you better start them early. Okay. Uh, some will be better than others genetically, but uh, practice also matters. More about brain development. So experience will also affect myelination. You experience, right? Infants uh, will spend more time looking and listening. Okay. 
And that allows the visual and auditory cortex to be myelinated. That's, those are the first thing to be myelinated. I think we've mentioned that before. During the play years, which is ages two to six, that's what we're talking about. It's also called early childhood. So it's called ages two to six, early childhood, the play years, that's ages two to six. So during the, these play years, myelination is dedicated to memory and reflection. Okay, so their memory will get a lot better to be better able to stop and think, right? A five-year-old is a lot less impulsive uh, than a two-year-old, okay? A two-year-old doesn't really think, and they'll cross the street without looking. You need to watch them, okay? Five-year-old is a lot less impulsive. They can stop and think before acting. You should still not have your five-year-old crossing the street by themselves, or even your seven-year-old, although children are capable of that. They can, but come on, you should be watching them, taking care of them, okay? Um, but yes, they can stop and think and can are a little bit better at keeping themselves safe. A lot better, actually. So myelination also makes uh, coordinated reflection more possible, right? They can stop, think, they can remember before crossing the street. They can remember how to do things, right? You throw them a ball, they can, you know, they can move their arms in the, in the right place, their hands, and catch it. So all that is because of myelination, but also because of experience, okay? So they get a lot better during ages two to six. It's just myelin is developing rapidly, and that allows faster neurotransmission, more complicated neurotransmission, and that will, will help with everything, okay? With their thinking, their memory, their language, their movement, just about everything. Lateralization also uh, is important. Lateralization uh, develops uh, rapidly as well. Lateralization uh, has to do with uh, the fact that there's two sides to the brain and that certain functions are on one side or the other. So the two sides of the brain can be somewhat specialized. Lateralization mean that, means that a certain function is more on one side than the other. Like for instance, motor function. Um, I think I might have said this before, but mo when it comes to movement, that's motor function, okay? The left side of the brain actually controls the right side of the body. And the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body. That's how motor function works. So, so it's lateralized, okay? The left side of the brain controls the right side of the body. And the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body. So movement is either on one side or the other, depending on which side of the brain, well, then it'll affect the reverse side of the body. Uh, the left side of the brain also controls logic, things have to do with math, Detailed analysis and language is on the left side of the brain. The right side is the more creative and emotional side of the brain, right? Things have to do with music, art, and poetry, okay? And if damage occurs early on, uh, you know, the brain functions can switch and move to the other side. Like if the, the left side of the brain is damaged, let's say, and that would impair language. In some cases, the brain has been shown to kind of rewire itself and then the language area might move instead to the right side of the brain. That has happened. It doesn't happen very often, but it does happen. And if that does happen to your child because they have some kind of brain damage, consider yourself very lucky, okay? It doesn't always happen, okay? But yes, the brain is what we call plastic. The brain can change. It can be affected by experience. But uh, of course, you know, severe brain damage will lead to severe impairment. And that's not always the case that the brain adjusts magically like that. Sometimes it does. Uh, the corpus callosum, um, you know, is basically that bridge uh, between the two halves of the brain, the main bridge, the main connection. You can see there on the image in the middle, right? The part that looks a little bit purple or pinkish, okay? So it's a bundle of nerves, okay, that, uh, that contains about 250 to 800 million fibers, okay, that coordinate the action of the two hemispheres. So the two sides of the brain, the left and the right, need to be able to communicate with one another. And the signals travel back and forth via this bridge. Think of it like a bridge, a road, that allows one side, to talk, one side of the brain to talk to the other side, okay? So signals travel back and forth. The corpus callosum, it turns out that it myelinates very rapidly from ages two to six, which speeds neurotransmissions. That allows the two halves of the brain to communicate with one another more effectively. Because actually all cognitive skills require the left and right side of the brain. We tend to think of the brain as, you know, in isolated parts. Language is over here, math is over here, or movement is over here. But as a matter of fact, the brain communicates with the other parts of the brain constantly. When you are doing something, it's not just movement that's taking place. It's also thinking and memory and language because you're often talking about it as well if you're talking to somebody about it. Um, so all these skills need to coordinate and the signals need to travel back and forth. 
there's actually no such thing as a left or right brain person. Yes, some people are more creative, maybe they call themselves more right brain, or some people are more are better at language and math, and they say they're more left brain, but there's actually no such thing. You use your entire brain, and the part, different parts of the brain communicate with one another to make all these things, these skills, you know, possible. Okay, it's not one part of the brain that's functioning and the others are not. More about brain development. Um, the prefrontal cortex uh, matures uh, a bit more during ages two to six. It's not fully mature, by the way. The prefrontal cortex will not be completely developed, will not be fully mature up until maybe age 19, 18, late teens, or even early 20s, according to some research but it matures a bit further from ages two to six. Remember the prefrontal cortex allows you to control yourself, control those impulses, control your emotions, control your, your movement, right? To con control yourself, right? So, you know, to focus to, and control those emotions, to control yourself so you don't lash out when you're angry, okay? Uh, or, you know, you control your, uh, you know, where you focus to looking at this rather than that as opposed to being very distract distracted, being able to, uh, you know, uh, not act out in a tantrum, for instance. That's all because of the prefrontal cortex. Well, it matures a bit more during, from ages two to six. Uh, and that's partly shown by something known as perseveration, where children can persevere. They can focus on something and continue doing the same thing. Perseveration is a tendency to stick to one thought or action after it has become useless or inappropriate. And it's something that a lot of children will, will show where they'll sing the same song over and over again. They'll draw the same picture over and over again. They'll watch the same show, throw a tantrum. What they're doing is they're focusing on one thing and they're doing that over and over again. You might have noticed that some in, in your kids, you know, that, uh, you know, they might uh, like to watch like My Little Pony or something like that. And they'll watch the same episodes again and again. If you have Netflix, the good thing is that they can choose to watch what they want to watch. And if they want to watch episode one, again, season one, they can do it and they can watch it as many times as they want and go through that. Um, and in the past, it wasn't possible when, you know, when just the cable company controlled when, what you watch and when you watch it. But kids do this, you know, they will draw the same picture, watch the same thing over and over again, and they don't seem to get bored. It's, it's called perseveration. They're getting the ability to kind of focus, to control what they pay attention to, and they'll tend to overdo it. And they might dance and listen to the same song again and again, or, you know, or dance the same thing, or, you know, and they do that. Uh, that's called perseveration. They persevere. By three or four years of age, uh, there's uh, advances in the prefrontal cortex that make th their impulse control and formal education possible. For ages three to four is when children are good enough at controlling themselves, at following directions and focusing, that you can actually put them in school. You start you know, by putting them in preschool, and then they move on to kinder by like age five, and then they might be at you know, first grade by age six, okay? Um, but you know, the advances in the prefrontal cortex is what makes this education possible, right? The ability for them to control their emotions and not throw so many tantrums, right? To focus here rather than there, right? Um, you know, that makes, uh, it makes education possible. Temper tantrums are very common among two-year-olds. They throw a lot of tantrums. By age five, they're less common. And in adulthood, you shouldn't be seeing any tantrums. Although there are adults who throw tantrums here and there, we don't call them tantrums though. We say that they had a hissy fit or that they had a, or, or that they threw a fit. You know, when somebody gets so upset, they start throwing chairs and cussing up a storm and they start, you know, behaving like that out of control. Uh, that's a tantrum. It's just that we don't call it that in adulthood. But it's rare in adulthood, but very common in two-year-olds. By age five, they're a lot less common. And they, be, and they get less common as you get older. But yes, little kids are very hard to raise. They're very difficult. They get less difficult as they get older, assuming you have a normal child. Let's keep going. Let's uh, talk about the limbic system some more. Uh, we mentioned the limbic system, uh, I, I think before, um, that it's basically the part of the brain that has to do with emotion, learning, and memory. Well, the amygdala, if you recall, it produces emotional behavior. It's involved with aggression and fear. The amygdala is what becomes active when a child gets scared, okay? Like it's, it's, it's what is responsible for nightmares. When your kid has a nightmare, the amygdala basically became active and stimulated fear, right? Or they have fear of the boogeyman, right? That's because of the amygdala. It's the part of the brain that makes you scared. 
And that's also the part of the brain that makes you aggressive because fear and aggression go together. It's part of the fight or flight response. The limbic system also includes, it also includes the hippocampus. The hippocampus allows the brain to store memories. It's involved in the story of memories. Um, it allows you to learn new memories, okay? Uh, things that are emotional are easy to remember, especially for children, okay? They remember something they were scared of, something they don't like, right? Now, when it comes to content, you know, remembering a specific thing, the meaning of a certain word, or where they learn something, that is more limited. They have more trouble with that. Like if they know, let's say, the, they know, uh, let's say what, uh, what the word lava means, for instance, right? And you might ask them, oh, what did you learn that? You learned that in school? The kid might say something like, oh, I always knew that, or I figured it out by myself. Like, no, you didn't. You learned that somewhere, but they don't remember, okay? The content source, right, where they learned something, that is harder for them. They, they don't always remember that. But emotions are very easy to remember. That stuff they do remember well. They do remember when they don't like somebody, when they don't like someone, right? Or when they fear something. That's, that's, uh, those memories are formed very strongly very early on. The hypothalamus, uh, remember, is, is responsible for the, flight or flight, the fight or flight response. So the hypothalamus will send signals to the amygdala, will stimulate fear and aggression, right? It's arousing. It will also respond to the hippo, it will also communicate with the hippocampus and the hippocampus allows you to store memories. And if you recall certain memories, right, that can be dampening, that can reduce the fear. If you remember that, for instance, not all dogs are scary or cats aren't necessarily scary, right? To, um, you know, in responding to an emergency. So the hypothalamus sends a signal to the amygdala. The amygdala will basically stimulate fear and aggression. The hippocampus, when it becomes active, can reduce that fear or aggression, depending on what you think of, what you remember. So the hypothalamus controls the, uh, the fight or flight response, right? Controls that stress, that anxiety, right? Prolonged stress in children, right? Uh, can actually lead to problems. It can lead to, lead to poor emotional development, poor emotional regulation where the child is basically uh, very agitated. The child is easily upset, easily angered, easily stressed out, okay? Uh, and will also impair them cognitively, will impair their learning, their memory, because a child that is easily stressed out or very anxious, very fearful, cannot focus very well and cannot learn very well. That's, uh, and the hypothalamus is involved with those things. You don't want to expose your kid to too much stress, too much anxiety. Motor skills, um, we mentioned these before, gross motor skills and fine motor skills. We're just gonna talk about what's possible during this age. I mean, this will keep coming back, okay? So there's more coordination um, uh, and, and speed of the arms and legs from ages two to six. So children's motor skills improve drastically uh, from ages two to six. Like I said before, they become slimmer, but they also become stronger and they're less top heavy. Their head isn't so big anymore compared to the rest of their body, okay? So, uh, so they, they're, and their prefrontal cortex, we mentioned that advances, right? The myelination, the, there's myelination of the corpus callosum, which allows the two halves of the brain to communicate with one another. All of this will lead to improvement in gross motor skills. They improve dramatically. So running, climbing, jumping, you know, riding a bike, all those things will improve. But of course, practice is important. Your kid won't learn to ride a bike if you never teach them how to ride a bike, okay? Or if you never put them on a bike, okay? But they'll get a lot better at running and climbing and jumping, and they may even get involved in sports, um, and they get a lot better, okay? Two-year-olds are very clumsy, can easily fall and hurt themselves. They're not very good at sports. Five-year-olds are more skillful, more graceful, and it just depends on what level your kid is at, how much practice they've had, and genetically how gifted they are, let's say, when it comes to movement. But uh, many five-year-olds can already skate. They can dive. They can ride a bicycle, okay? They can do lots of things, you know, might be even capable of swimming, depending on whether you teach them, you know, whether you expose them to that stuff and how good they are. Some are develop it much faster than others. I, uh, I have uh, my cousin's... Uh, uh, son, he's older now, he's a teenager now, but um, that would be my second cousin, by the way, they're called second cousins, but uh, yeah, my, uh, my, uh, my cousin's son, uh, when he was four years old, he could already skateboard, he was skating already, okay, um, very good at, uh, at that movement, and then, you know, my, you know, I told my cousin, like, yeah, your kid's very advanced, you know, compared to where he should be, so, he, you know, he put him in, in soccer. He was really good at soccer and will, you know, will score like four goals, you know, uh, during the soccer game and win the game and stuff like that. 
You put him in basketball. He's good at basketball too. Problem is he's not very tall. You know, I'm not very tall. Neither is my cousin. And, uh, you know, my cousin's only like 5'7", five, 5'8". Five, His kid might be 5'9", when he's full grown or something like that. He's not going to probably be some star athlete because of that, but he's very good at sports. But in order for you to be short and be a professional athlete, you don't, I mean, you have to be amazing, okay, to make up for the fact that you're short. And there's very few players that are that good, okay? Now, if you're tall and good, then you pretty much have it made. If you're really tall, 6'9", and you're, you're good at basketball, then you have a much better chance. But not too many people grow to be 6'9". If you're seven feet tall, and, and if you're just a little bit good at basketball, uh, you could probably make the team, the college team, if you're that tall, okay? You just need some training, okay? And if you're good, then even better. You might make it to the NBA if you're that tall. But not a lot of people do, of course. More about motor skills now. There's also fine motor skills that involve small body movements. You know, the small fingers, small, I mean, small muscles, small bones. Uh, these are still difficult for children during this time, from ages two to six. They lack muscular control at that level, right? Patience, judgment, hand-eye coordination. Some are better than others. But their fingers are still kind of short and stubby at this time, and their brains are not fully developed, okay? So they can have trouble cutting straight, folding paper, buttoning their shirt, tying their shoes, you know, cutting the meat with a knife, using a fork. They can learn, they can get better, but they're still not that great at that, okay? They can still be messy and have problems with that. Gross motor skills are a lot better at fine motor skills. They need more practice. They need more brain development. Scissors, pencils, knives, forks, all that stuff, they're usually made for adults. They do have special scissors, pencils, and knives, and, you know, things for, for children, and they're different. They're a little bit smaller. They're, they're thicker. The pencils are thicker, you know, the scissors, so that it's safe for them. Um, but they're not very good at that stuff. And uh, fine motor skills also uh, relates to artwork, okay? Okay, children will get better and better at drawing, at, uh, you know, at just creating things as they get older, okay? Artwork requires fine motor skills, whether they're drawing or playing an instrument or sculpting something or whatever it is, it requires fine motor skills. Children from ages two to six are very imaginative, okay, and the kind of things that they think of, right? Very creative, and they're not very self-critical. You can see those drawings there, they're not very good, not for an adult, but they think they're not, that they're awesome. And that's good that they are not very self-critical because it allows them to take pride in their work and then they get better and better. As the brain develops and fine motor skills mature, artwork greatly improves. So you can see the first image there on the bottom left, that is um, probably a two-year-old, okay? And you can see they could probably draw some circles, some ovals and not very well. And then you have a four-year-old in the middle. They can draw a little bit better, some people there you know, some circles, some arms and legs, not very good. By age six, you can see that they're a lot better, all right? That's a lot better drawing of a, probably a, of a girl there, right? Not great, but kids will get better. And some will, and, and there's a lot of variation, by the way. Some kids are really good at art, some of them in the middle, and some of them uh, not good at all, okay? For me, I'm somewhere in the middle. I'm not great. I have a brother who's really great at art, who's always drawing things since he was a kid. And um, I guess I have some of, those, some of those genetics too because my daughter is really, really good at art. See that, two year, that six year old boy there that drew that? My daughter could draw a lot better than that by age four. I, have, I don't have any images here, but I have some images that we posted on the wall and stuff. Uh, I mean, by, by like age six, my daughter was drawing things already that looked like cartoon characters like you see on TV. Not in 3D, of course, one dimensional, but she's that good at art. It's just a, very, a skill that she has that's very good. She's also very good at language. You know, and that's, uh, that's opposite sides of the brain, creative and, and language. She's not very good at math, but you know, she needs a lot of help with that and I'm, that's what I'm here for. I'm very good at math, I guess. Um, you know, um, I'm not just bragging here. Yeah, I, I was an engineering major at first before I switched to psychology. Not good enough to be an engineer. I'm not that great at math, okay? But children will vary. There's a lot of variation. Some of them will be very good at these fine motor skills, very good at art or music, whatever it is, and some will be in the middle. It just depends. But practice matters. But children will naturally gravitate toward the things they like. You need to provide opportunity, okay? So adults need to set the stage for motor development. Adults need to facilitate things. You need to provide them with a safe place for them to play or draw or do, or, or, or do whatever they, they want to do, okay? 
safe place for them to play, you know, their music, their sports, for them to draw or, you know, or whatever it is. Time for them to play. You must give them time, okay? Now, I know children during this stage, stage they might be going to preschool uh, or even kindergarten if they're a little bit older. You know, by six, they probably started first grade. And school can take up a lot of time, you know, taking them there, then there's school, like six hours, then you pick them up, bring them home, and then they eat, and then, you know, they have to do their homework. You need to give them time to play. You need to make sure that you give them that time, especially right now that, uh, you know, we're doing things via Zoom, right, because of the pandemic. And, um, and kids are spending a lot of time in front of a screen, okay? They're spending a lot of time. It, you know, the Zoom classes are getting longer and longer. They want to make sure that the kids spend as much time in school at home via Zoom as they do at school. And it's a lot of screen time, okay? And then, of course, you know, they, they also do, you know, also will play on their little tablets or iPads or whatever it is uh, or watch TV. So they're getting a lot of screen time. And you need to give them time to play. You need to take them outside and let them play. Let them run around. You need to make time for them for that. Of course, with appropriate equipment. You know, you need to have the appropriate equipment. And, and when you buy things like swings and, you know, toys and things like that, it'll say what kind of age is good for that, uh, you know, for, you know, for that, uh, that equipment. You know, when you take them to the park, it even says there, you know, that these, these slides over here and these towers are for, you know, kids that are at least seven years of age. Or this is for, and the ones that are smaller, these are for kids who are five and younger or something like that. But you need to give them the opportunity, right? Take them to the park. Take them outside, buy them things, make sure they have a chance to play. And of course, the more income you have, right, the better neighborhood you live in, the more opportunities there are for that. Good neighborhoods have a lot of things available, a lot more, a lot better equipment, a lot better parks, and even maybe even little lagoons where they can ride a little paddle boats, all sorts of things. If you're poor and you live in a really messed up place, there's probably not much. And sometimes the equipment is damaged and broken and not very safe. Um, you need to let them play, you know, spend time with playmates. Arrange play dates if you can. You know, their friendships are not very strong during this time, but they want to be with other kids. They want to play with other kids just naturally. You know, if you just have them at home and you'll see them, sometimes they're looking across the fence if it's a chain link fence, and you'll often see that they're looking at other kids. They want to play with them. You need to provide those opportunities, okay? They naturally gravitate toward the things that they like. How might increased urbanization hinder or help motor development? Yeah, a lot of us live, most of us live in cities now and often dense cities. Not here in the Antelope Valley, it's not too dense, but in other places, LA is very dense. San Francisco, New York, a lot of places are very dense. That's what most people live in cities. In a lot of these places, there's too much car, too much traffic, too much noise. And they, people live in apartment buildings or buildings, high rises, and they may not have much of a yard. There may not be much of a park for kids to play. So that can hinder their development. You need to take them places. And that's why we also like to go to the outdoors, right? We can go to the beach, go to the mountains, you know, the deserts, you know, assuming that, you know, it's at the right time of the year, right? For them to play. We live in a desert here, but you need to provide those opportunities. Um, now there are things that can be harmful uh, during, uh, during this time. I think there's always things that can be harmful during any stage of life. But children during this age, they consume a lot of air. So they breathe in a lot of air. They consume a lot of food, a lot of water per pound of body weight. Their organs are still developing. So they're very susceptible to basically getting to having, uh, having their brains be damaged or impaired if they're exposed to the wrong things. Okay. Uh, what about testing? You know, there's a lot of things that are untested, a lot of chemical combinations. That creates a challenge. The way this country works is that People come up with new products and maybe a new cleaning spray or solution or something like that, or a new toy made with a new kind of plastic or a new product. And what happens is it's legal as long as there isn't something that's, as there isn't some study that says that that is uh, harmful. And then if there's a study that says it's harmful, then they need to pass a law to outlaw that substance. And then they have to make the toys and the other things out of things that are better for kids. But uh, hey, if it's not tested, and it could still be harmful, and they just don't know. And in this country, if you don't know, that means it's okay. You can use it. So you have to prove that it's harmful before something can be taken away. And in the past, kids were playing with things that are, were very harmful. The plastic in toys, the, pla the kind of plastic that was being used was harmful. It, create, it contained harmful substances. Some of the foods we ate were harmful. They contained pesticides that we know are very harmful. 
So now there's a, there's a lot more testing now, but still, you know, the burden is on the researchers, the scientists to show that those things are harmful, to prove that they're not safe. Otherwise, business will continue producing them, continue using them. I mean, what about, uh, you know, even foods that are, you know, where they're using genetically modified organisms, you know, GMO foods, they're genetically altering the food. Is it harmful? Well, studies haven't really shown that it's harmful yet. So guess what? Everything you're buying for the most part, unless it says non-GMO organic, you're eating all that stuff. And is it harmful? We don't know. We'll probably know in the future, decades from now. Okay. Because sometimes things take years, decades to cause harm. Okay. Uh, a big problem is, uh, is lead, lead in pipes and in paint in old houses and old buildings. And uh, lead was identified uh, as a poison a century ago, a long time ago. They knew it was harmful. The U.S. didn't ban it right away. They didn't ban lead paint until 1978, and they didn't, uh, they didn't remove it from fuels until 1996, even though they knew it was harmful since like the 40s. Why is that? Because this is a very rich country, very business-oriented, uh, okay? Very, uh, you know, uh, money, business matters a lot in this country. So what they do when they find out that something is harmful, they allow the businesses to continue producing it, continue selling the stuff, and they give them time to switch, to change the technology, change the products, and then so they can adjust. And that could take years. In the meantime, though, your kids or you, you know, you're being exposed to that stuff, and it causes harm. And sadly, it's always the children who are low SES, low socioeconomic status, the poor kids who are more likely to be exposed to that lead paint. That lead paint, right? Because they live in old houses that are, older houses are cheaper, right? They're, they're, they were built during times where they didn't know that, that paint, that having lead and paint was, was harmful. Uh, they, the house might have a popcorn ceiling. Popcorn ceilings often can have asbestos, which can cause cancer if you breathe it for long periods of time. Okay, all these things, right? Low SES children are exposed to just more pollution in the air. They tend to live near factories, near slaughterhouses. Um, and that's what happens. The poor end up living in the less desirable places. That's where there's more pollution, more air pollution, more toxic chemicals, right? Older homes that are less safe. Uh, and that's the way it is. And the rich could always live in the nicer areas where things are safer. Better air quality, better schools, uh, newer, more updated schools. Um, away from the power plants, away from the pollution. Uh, and that's just the way it is. And you try to even open up a power plant or, or some kind of slaughterhouse or some business, some factory that's gonna be spewing pollution in a, in a rich neighborhood and you'll see what will happen. I mean, they sue like crazy. They will not allow that to happen. Those things usually end up in poor neighborhoods and that's where the poor people live. So the poor people are often are the ones that get exposed to this stuff. Uh, the Flint, Michigan water crisis. Remember that? Where did that happen? A poor neighborhood, right? They tried to switch the water supply of the, uh, of the, the community there to, um, instead of it being coming from the Great Lakes, the water, they tried to switch it to some river. And, uh, and, and they tried to use basically their own uh, kind of water system. They had one that they hadn't used in decades. So they tried to get it going again. They didn't really know what they were doing. They didn't, they didn't do things properly. And they ended up basically exposing a, a bunch of people to, uh, to basically lead. Probably did damage to a lot of kids' brains. And those kids will suffer because of that. Their intelligence will suffer. You can see here in this graph how kind of uh, exposure to lead has kind of dropped over the decades as they banned it and, and you found it less and less in products. But it's still there. It's in that lead paint in old homes, you know, that are built in the 70s or 50s. Or you know, it, it's in those pipes, uh, those old homes with uh, with those uh, with those old pipes. They use lead for welding back then for soldering, um, and that's why newer homes are more exp expensive because newer homes have, uh, you know, they there's newer regulations now to make sure that those things aren't done anymore. And that's the thing, you know, uh, lead is a powerful neurotoxin and it will affect the developing brain. And your kid won't be as smart if they're exposed to lead, right? Um, there's other things that, uh, that are very likely, very possible during this time, injuries and abuse. Ages two to six, uh, the period of time we're talking about, children are very susceptible to getting hurt, okay? They're better at running and jumping, all stuff, they're doing a lot of things, but they can very easily get hurt. Okay, so we're gonna talk about injuries and abuse, okay? So injuries, one to four-year-olds are the most vulnerable to accidental death and injury. 
one to four year olds, okay? Because they're already walking, they're running around often, and their brain is not well developed. They don't know how to keep themselves safe. Fatal injuries for preschoolers, you know, are more common during this time. You know, they can easily be poisoned. They, they can, you know, drink something that's poisonous. You know, they, I mean, there's fuel caps now that are safe, you know, for like when you have, if you have like a, 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 a gallon of gas or where you're supposed to keep, you know, there's something now that's kind of childproof. It's very hard to open it or, you know, or those medicines or all kinds of things that are, you know, that they, a lot of things come in kind of a, you know, kid proof kind of, they have kid proof, you know, caps and stuff. So kids can easily get into it. But in the past kids would, uh, will get into that stuff and they would drink poison or a lot of kids died because of that. There, it's very easy for them to start a fire or, or to choke, okay? If they, you know, eat something that's too big for them, they can easily drown. Kids don't know how to swim at this age by the most part. You can teach your kids how to swim, by the way, very early on. They can learn how to swim very early. They can learn to swim by age three or four. It just depends if you have access to a pool and you know how to teach them how to swim. But by this time, most kids do not know how to swim and they can easily drown. So it's very important that you keep the kids away from the pool, that you have a fence that's at least five feet tall all around the pool and you watch your kids. A lot of children drown. Immature to prefrontal cortex. So the front part of the brain is not fully developed. So children are impulsive. Okay, they'll walk right into the pool. You know, they'll throw themselves in the pool and they don't know that it's the deep end or that they can drown. They'll walk right across the street without thinking and they can get hit by a car. Drowning is actually uh, the leading cause of unintentional death for one to five year olds. Think about that, drowning, right? Especially live in a hot place. A lot of people have pools in California. It's a very, very dangerous thing for children. You need the pool to be safe. You need a five foot fence around it. So very strict regulations about that. But if you live in an older home and it has a pool, guess what? That pool probably is not up to code. You probably may not even have a fence or a fence that is big enough. I moved into one of these old homes. My home was built in 1975. My pool has a fence around it, but guess what? The fence is only three feet tall. Back then, I guess in the 70s it was probably okay. Um, but so I had to update the stupid pool when I remodeled it. And I even bought a pool cover for it that I can, I, that I can cover the pool with um, that you can even walk on and you won't fall through. And it used to have an automatic pool cover that you can just click with a click of a button the pool cover comes out and it covers the pool. I didn't do that. That cost more than $10,000. But I did buy the expensive pool cover and put in the anchor so I can cover that thing and keep it closed when it's not in use. And whenever the kids do use the pool, we are with them, me or my wife. My kids are seven and nine now. They can both swim very well. Even though my kids, are, one of my, my boys on the autism spectrum, because my daughter learned how to swim, he wants to be just like her. So he wanted to learn how to swim. And uh, he can swim now, you know, doggy paddle, stuff like that. But let's just say he's not going to drown. He jumps into the deep end and swims the length of the pool, you know, doggy paddle. He doesn't swim very well. I mean, but he can swim. He's not going to drown. That doesn't mean I'm not going to watch him. I still watch him. But, uh, you know, there's a lot less uh, risk of drowning when your kids are already seven and, and older. But some kids still don't know how to swim by that age. So it just depends. Have your kids learned how to swim? Have they, you know, did you grow up around the swimming pool? Did you learn? You know, do you take lessons and all that stuff? So all that is important. You need to keep your kids safe and pools are very dangerous. Pools are dangerous in general, even for adults, by the way. Don't be getting drunk or high or on drugs and, and be using the pool. You could, you could end up drowning yourself, okay? Um, other stuff um, that's also very important to know during this time, child maltreatment. Very common during this age that children are mistreated in different ways. We'll talk about it. Child maltreatment is the general uh, term, um, you know, that in, involves uh, intentional or even avoidable harm, uh, endangerment to anyone less than 18. Children is, are, anyone under 18 is considered a child. You might intentionally harm them, or maybe it was unintentional, or it could have been avoided, or you neglected them. All that is considered child maltreatment. It comes in many forms. Uh, maltreatment, child maltreatment is more likely if children are difficult and mothers are depressed or the family's under stress because of poverty. Difficult children are very likely to be maltreated because they're difficult. They drive you crazy, okay? They, you know, they misbehave a lot. You know, they keep you up at night. Uh, they're, they're very difficult. So what happens is as a parent, you get frustrated, you get upset. And if you're not very patient, if you don't have a lot of patience, you might beat up your kid or mistreat them. You know, yank their hair, 
beat them up. Uh, difficult children are more likely to be uh, maltreated, more likely to be abused, okay? When mothers are depressed, they're also more likely to maltreat their children, more like, their children are more likely to be maltreated. Why? Because mothers uh, who are depressed are also very grouchy and irritable and they wanna be left alone and, uh, and, and will be more harsh with their kids. And also when they are depressed, they're more likely to neglect their kids because they kind of want to withdraw and be left alone. My wife kind of went through that. Uh, mother didn't really beat her, but she was depressed and uh, she had to kind of fend for herself to some extent. You know, my wife was making like uh, TV dinners when she was like six years old. That's what happens. Hey, there's some food in the fridge, help yourself to whatever you need. And their mother was just in bed all day, all depressed. Um, if the family's under stress because of poverty or other difficulties, Okay, uh, I mean, when people are under stress, uh, they are frustrated, they are angry, and they're more likely to take it out on their kids, abuse their kids, and hurt their kids as a result, okay? Child maltreatment is actually not rare, it happens a lot. And the perpetrators are usually the kids' own parents. We worry about strangers hurting our kids, physically, sexually abusing our kids, but it's more likely to be the child's own parents or a relative or someone like that, people who have more access to the child. Okay, those are the people who hurt your children. It's usually the parents or some relative that you trusted. It turns out you couldn't trust them. Okay, that's what actually happens, ends up happening. You should always watch your kids, of course, even keep them, you know, keep, uh, you know, make sure that you, you know, you don't let strangers harm them also, but you need to also be careful with children who are very close to your child, right? Uh, you know, the, the, you know, the father, the mother, the aunt, the uncle, the grandparent, all of those people can mistreat the child and physically abuse and sexually abuse the child. Child abuse, uh, a, a form of child maltreatment is where there's a deliberate action. It's done on purpose, intentionally. Delivered harm to the child's physical, emotional, or sexual well-being. So the child might be physically beaten or emotionally abused in which the child's being, they're cussing out the kid or, or making the child fearful. You know, and that's a kind of emotional abuse. Um, or even sexual. Uh, sexual abuse is a, is, is, a kind, is a kind of child abuse that's more specific, sexual abuse. Okay, child neglect is the failure to appropriately meet the child's basic physical and emotional needs. With child neglect, it's basically you're not feeding your kids properly or not feeding them enough or, you know, not keeping them safe from harm, right? Uh, you're neglecting them and your children are getting hurt, you know? or they're not being fed, they're being physically or sexually abused because you're not taking care of them, you're neglecting them. And the Anno Valley is often in the news for things like this. Whenever they were in the news, it's always because of something bad, stuff like this. Um, how frequent is uh, child maltreatment? Uh, well, reports have increased since 1950, reports have increased, okay? But substantiated rates, whether you can prove that it happened, uh, that has decreased, right? It happened, we know it happens a lot more often, but to prove it is actually very hard. <clears throat> There's fewer homes with children nowadays than there used to be. Uh, <clears throat> that may, one, might be one reason why, you know, the, we see it less often or, with, or at least the proven cases of child uh, maltreatment are, are, are less so uh, because maybe there's fewer children, but there's also variation in the level of professional scrutiny related to abuse. So it also matters which state you're in. In some states like California, uh, they, you know, it's a very big deal and they have uh, social workers and people who check on kids who are at risk and, uh, and, and you know, child and protective services, um, uh, you know, but it still happens. You know, they miss things or they miss to see some of the warning signs sometimes where children end up being abused or are being abused. In other states, they also do things like that, but they may not care as much about it or the law may not be as strong and it, may ha it can happen more in other places. It just depends on the law. In some states, you know, they care more about freedom. They leave me and my family alone and you know, that kind of stuff. And, uh, and basically that means that, that they don't often have the laws that are necessary or, or the um, social workers don't often have uh, the legal means to actually check up as much um, on these kids as much as they could, but it happens a lot. Actually, my, uh, my wife's um, sister actually had her kids taken away. Why? Because uh, she wasn't taking care of them as much. The kids would show up to school dirty and stinky, you know, uh, because she's busy working all day. The husband's disabled, 
So the kids are basically, you know, just eating a bunch of junk food and getting all obese and they won't put you, they won't take away your kids for that. But the kids also are not getting bathed. They're not getting baths. They're not get, having their clothes changed. And, you know, and that's what's happening. And they got the kids taken away. And now she has to prove to, you know, some, you know, prove that she can provide an adequate environment for them and properly feed them and keep, call them and keep them well fed and clean and stuff to get them back. She has to prove that. It's been like over a month and she's yet to get her kids. But actually the whole coronavirus thing, the pandemic has kind of slowed those things down. And now it's harder, you know, to get, to get the kids back if they should be taken away because of that. Maltreatment is often underreported as well. Neighbors will report it 5%, about 5% of the times that it is reported, it's neighbors. 7% of the time it's relatives, you know, but it's hard to, uh, it's hard to, um, you know, to find out if it's happening because the abuser will often hide. Well, and children are often isolated, so you don't see them. These kids that are being abused, you don't see them too much. Uh, these parents who are abusing their kids will often change their addresses, you know, frequently. They don't, they move around a lot, and usually they have other problems, like unemployment or drug use or poverty and stuff like that, and they'll move around a lot. And they'll often, you know, you know, keep the kids isolated or neglect them or abuse the kids. It's harder to raise children if life is hard, um, but often goes underreported. The children are often afraid to report you know, their own parents. Why? Because they want to be with their parents. They don't want to be taken away. They don't want their parents to be taken away from them. Other things, um, child maltreatment is actually quite common. About one in four children in the U.S. Uh, will suffer physical abuse. Think about that, one in four, right? One in 22, sexual abuse before sixth grade. So it's actually very common during this age. Uh, and it's a lot more, sexual abuse is a lot more common in girls. In girls, it's like one in 10. Okay, and in boys, it's like maybe uh, it, it's less common. Okay, I don't remember the exact statistics. Actually, uh, it, it just depends on the age. But by the time you're a teenager, I'll put it to you this way: by the time you're a teenager, uh, females about one in five, one in six, have suffered sexual abuse, and boys are about maybe one in like ten. So it's very, very common. A lot more common than we think. Uh, warning signs that your child might be abused, uh, that suffering from something, delayed development, it will affect their growth if they're being neglected, not being fed properly. It, communication might be immature, they don't talk very much if they're being beaten and emotionally abused. Unusual social interactions, they might play games that are not proper for them to play, you know, or maybe pull down their pants or touch people in certain places because that kind of stuff has been happening to them. Post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, if you're beating them up and yelling at them all the time, you know, they can be fearful, easily startled, defensive, confused, right? Neglected children often withdrawn, self-critical, they're very shy and withdrawn, don't talk very much. Abused children tend to be aggressive, they tend to be angry, right? And they tend to act out more. Maltreated children in general are less likely to have friends. Um, yes, they, I mean, they, it will, their development will suffer. Uh, prevention, let's talk about prevention, okay? How do you prevent this? There's three levels of prevention. There's primary prevention, in which there's some change made to the environment to make injury less likely. So having sidewalks, for instance, speed bumps, crosswalks, you know, fences around the pool, all that is primary prevention, okay? To make sure that injury, uh, you know, happens, you know, less often, okay? Uh, secondary prevention, averting harm to individuals in high risk situations. So secondary prevention, are things that happen in high risk situations like around schools and in maybe hospitals, daycare, things like that to make injury less likely. So flashing lights on school buses, crossing guards, children walk with adults, all that is secondary prevention. It's, it's basically things that they do in high risk situations. There's a reason why you can't drive very fast when you're near a school or around hospitals, daycares, things like that. That's secondary prevention, high risk situations, things that are done there. Tertiary prevention is what basically changes that are made after injury that's aimed at limiting uh, the damage, right? You know, where they pass laws to, you know, have better emergency rooms, laws against hit and run driving, laws, against, laws preventing, you know, kind of, you know, the use and abuse of certain drugs. Um, it, it's that kind of stuff where they try to basically keep it from happening again by making changes in the law or changes or other changes that, that take place. Um, we're almost done here. Um, other ways to prevent maltreatment. If things should be really bad, uh, children can be taken away and they might end up in foster care. 
Foster care is when the child is removed from the parent's custody and entrusted to another adult. They're given to another adult to take care of them. And those people who take care of them may or may not be good parents. They may or may not be, do a good job. Children can also end up in foster care also because parents give them up, not necessarily because they've been abused, but yes, they can be taken away also and be, end up in foster care. Usually, good news is usually it's, it's kinship care. Usually the, the child is given to a relative, a grandparent, or maybe an aunt or an uncle to take care of them. Um, usually they don't end up with strangers, but they can, okay? And if they do end up with strangers, well, then it's even worse for the child, okay? About every year, about half a, mini, half a million children are actually officially in foster care, about one million unofficially. So there's a bunch of children in foster care officially, but there's a lot of children that are kind of in foster care, but nobody knows about it, where their grandparents are taking care of them. Their aunt or uncle is taking care of them because their real parents cannot, because they're working too hard or they're in jail or drug addicts or something like that. They haven't had their children taken away, but they're having somebody else take care of them for them because they can't do it. Permanency planning, sometimes children are taken away permanently because when your kid is taken away, you can get them back if you can prove that you're a good parent, but you have to prove and you have to jump through several hoops, go to court and, and, and things to get your kids back. Now, permanency planning is when they try to take, when they take the kids away permanently and the children are put up for adoption. But adoption is difficult because judges are often uh, reluctant to release children for adoption. They don't want to break up homes. Adoptive parents, people who do want to adopt children, they prefer infants. They want babies. They want really small children. They don't want, uh, you know, some 12-year-old, some 13-year-old. Um, the younger the kid, the better, the more easily it is to get them adopted. Uh, screening of families, um, you know, the families have to qualify and that usually means, the, you know, a, a lot of things. Financially, right, they have to be, at a, you know, be well off financially, middle class at least or better. Uh, they have to live in, a, they have to provide a good environment and a lot of people don't qualify. The adoptive, they often want adoptive parents of the same ethnicity, black kids with black kids, white kids with white kids, but that's often not possible, okay? And often the same religion, you know, Jewish kids with Jewish kids, Christian with Christian, but it's often not pass possible and all that makes adoption more difficult. And it does happen uh, very often that children of color end up being raised by white parents. Why? Because, well, this country, there are more white people here. About two thirds of people are white. You have more white families. So often you will have children of, co of, uh, of color, you know, black ch children, Latino kids uh, that will end up being raised by white families. Um, more like, more, more often than with black families because there's less black families and especially black families that meet the qualifications in order to be able to adopt a child. Um, all right, that is it, you guys. That is where we will stop.